So do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. That's what they say. And I'm sure everybody that is sitting here this morning has heard that quote countless times. Teachers use it, motivational speakers use it, celebrities all alike have used that in one way or another. It's plastered on motivational posters. We dole it out to recent graduates like it's the only piece of career advice that they're ever going to need. And it's used at the opening of speeches, just like me today. And it's used just to say, find what you love, do what you love, and you'll never work a day in your life. Well, <laughs> I'm not so sure. I think most of us here would believe that you can absolutely love the job that you're in, but still recognize simultaneously that it's work. Just because you absolutely love what you do or you're really passionate about what you do doesn't mean to say that at some stage you're not overwhelmed, you're not stressed, you're not exhausted, and it's not really, really hard work. Maybe the crux of it is summed up best by Tim Cook, and he's one of the CEOs of Apple. And he said, you will work probably harder than what you ever thought possible, but the tools will feel lighter in your hands. And I guess by that, he simply meant that if you love what you do, you'll work really hard, but maybe you won't mind so much that you have to do that. So I'm very lucky, I think, that I'm in a job that I do absolutely love. But my journey to get there, like everybody else that's sitting in this room, was not planned and a little bit varied. I am local, very local five miles out the road, um, and I, at this moment, I am the co-owner and director of a multifaceted Irish dancing business along with my husband. And that's kind of a very fancy way of simply saying we do a lot of stuff that's based around Irish dancing. Um, when I was initially asked to be involved in the TEDx event today, I have to admit I didn't really know much about TEDx. Didn't really know anything. So I googled it, as you do. And the definitions and the articles that came up all focused almost exclusively around engaging and charismatic speakers whose talks, and I'm quoting, I think, are relevant to an international audience. That was just a little bit daunting. Um, I don't see myself as engaging or charismatic. Winston Churchill said, continuous effort rather than strength or intelligence is the key to unlocking our potential. That's me, continuous effort. That's my approach to everything. I never give up. I never give in. I don't know the meaning of the word no and can't. It does get me into trouble sometimes. There's always a way. I'm no stranger to standing on a stage, as Catherine said. But I'm normally in dancing shoes, a show costume, a full face of um, show makeup, and a wig. Kind of wore wigs too. Um, and I think for me today, I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone. In familiar surroundings, with faces out there that I know <laughs> and can see, I would much rather Again, as Catherine said, I would much rather be in a venue in America with a spotlight in my face, 
performing to 10,000 people that I don't know and they don't know me. So this is a new challenge for me today, big time. My background is actually in education. I was a school teacher. I'm a very proud past pupil of Assumption Grammar School. From there, I went on to study at Queen's University, both as an undergrad and as a postgrad. And I immediately took up a position after graduating in Rathmore Grammar School in Belfast as an English and Theatre Studies teacher. And I was absolutely happy and settled with my life. I loved the classroom. I was super dedicated to the um, education profession. I loved my classroom environment and I loved the kids that I taught. And I was engaged to be married. The house was bought, the dress was bought. So I was on a very steady, settled, solid path in my life. And then it changed. And it wasn't my doing. Effectively, I got dumped. <laughs> Not a very nice way to do things. And I had a very difficult time accepting that that's what had happened in my life. Every plan that I had 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 gone out the window. I was pretty devastated. And I remember sitting in a classroom when the kids had all gone home. It was a mobile classroom. I'm thinking, oh my God, is this really my life for the next 33 years of service? And then an opportunity came along. And it was around that time that the curtain had really gone up all over the world on this show called Riverdance. And it was actually about a year after the iconic interval show at the Eurovision Song Contest and for whatever reason, Michael Flatley had decided to leave Riverdance and he was setting about creating his own new show. Steve Job talks about life being all about connecting the dots. You can't connect the dots looking forwards but you can definitely connect the dots looking backwards. So if you can't connect them looking forwards, you have to trust that the dots are going to line up somewhere in your future. You have to trust in something. So whether that's your gut, whether it's fate, destiny, karma, God, maybe like me, it's all of them. You have to trust that those dots will connect for you. And that's the way I have approached life. And that approach has never failed me. I've had one passion in my life, and still have, and that is Irish dancing. I started dancing reluctantly. When I was about three, my mother shoved me in through the door of an Irish dancing class. I probably wouldn't have stayed at it if my sister hadn't have been there to hold my hand. But I became pretty good at it. I was never the best dancer in the world. Sometimes I wasn't good enough. I never won a world. I tried quite a lot, <laughs> but I never won it. And I struggled my whole competitive career with nerves. I learned to dance at every competition for all of the years that I was involved in competition dancing, knowing that there was a fair chance I was going to throw up in the bin side stage before I ever put a foot under me to compete. But I was good enough to get a phone call one day to ask would I like to audition for Michael Flatley's new show, Lord of the Dance. So I had a choice to make. I did have a very good job. I did love my job. But I guess everything boils down to choice. Choice is the most powerful tool that we have. And there's an infinite possibilities 
when you look at your choices. And whatever choice you make, it's going to close an infinite number of doors, but equally, it's going to open an infinite number of doors. So I made the choice. I closed the door on the relationship. You know, it's kind of already closed. <laughs> and I also closed the door for the time being on my teaching career. I went to Diggs Lane in Dublin to the dance studio for the audition. And it was rigorous. There were hundreds, as you can imagine, there were hundreds of dancers there. It was fast moving, it was blunt, it was harsh, you either made it or you didn't. And I was one of the lucky ones in the fact that I made it through to the rehearsal stages. And rehearsals were a few weeks later and they were in England. So you were with a whole brand new bunch of people that you'd never met before. And if I thought that the audition process was tough, that was nothing to what the rehearsal period was like. We had seven days a week. We had seven weeks of rehearsals. We rehearsed from 8 a.m. in the morning until 8 p.m. at night. And we had 30 minutes off. I never felt pain like it in my life. I remember having to physically lift my legs at one stage into a taxi, which was taking me about five minutes up the road because I couldn't walk it. And not only were the, were the rehearsals physically demanding, but they were mentally and emotionally really tough. At the end of every week, without any explanation, two people were sent home. It was like The Apprentice. You're fired. No reason given. And we lived with that fear the whole rehearsal time. And I did like every other dancer that was there. I learned to rise above it. I learned to meet the challenges. I learned to work harder than I ever thought was possible. And I guess I learned what it was to strive for excellence because nothing else was tolerated. No excuses, no weaknesses, whether they were physical, emotional, or mental. You took the hard truths, you took the criticisms on the nose, as it were, and you moved on. And my resilience, I guess, was tested to the limit on the very last week of rehearsals. I went in, we were getting ready for an opening night, which was being held in New York, New York, and Las Vegas. And I was met with, who was watching Josephine's spot in that number? And I was in every number that was going. Who was watching Josephine's spot in that number? Great, Josephine, step out, you step in. No explanation given. Systematically, I was removed from every single number of that show. I'd learnt you don't ask questions. I'd learnt you don't show it on your face. And it wasn't until the very last day of rehearsals that I was brought in to the office. I thought I was getting a plane ticket home. And they said, you're not going to Las Vegas, Josephine. We're sending you to a different troupe. So it was, there was a bit of relief that I wasn't being sent home, but sheer devastation that the people that I'd worked with for seven weeks and got to know they were my family, I was never going to dance with. But I was sent to the tour of the Americas. And what an opportunity that turned out to be. I did have to forge new friendships there. And I'm friendly now with some of those people that I met all those years ago. They are some of my closest friends now. And I guess, to cut a long story short, I toured the world with Michael Flatley 
for seven years. I became the sole dance captain of 52 dancers, both male and female, and our musicians and our singers. I was their confidant, I was their boss, I was their teacher, I was their mother in many cases. Some of the kids that came into us later on were only 16 and 17. I was given the responsibility for training the new cast members, auditioning new cast members, and then training them. I became the lead performer in the show. I was the girl in the red dress. I was the temptress. It was great. <laughs> and I did all the publicity for the show. So I did morning TV, where I did morning interviews. I did radio broadcasts, and I did interviews for magazines. And remember, this is the same girl who was throwing up in a bucket at the side of the stage. And that girl hasn't changed. I still can get really worked up and nervous. Realistically, I really still feel that pressure. I've just learnt how to disguise it a little bit better. But I guess the seven years that I was with Lord of the Dance shaped me into the person I am today. I played iconic venues, predominantly in North America, South America, and Canada. I danced on the stage in the Kodak Theatre where the um, Oscars are held. I performed in Radio City, in Madison Square Gardens. I've toured in Buenos Aires, in Rio de Janeiro, in Santiago, in Austral Asia. And the biggest audience I think I ever performed to was 37 and a half thousand people in Hyde Park in London. It was electric. But at times it did still feel like work. There were aspects of my job as dance captain that I absolutely dreaded having to do. There were days when I felt that my body couldn't go on. But I had to, because the show had to go on. There were workouts from hell, and there were pressures that only if you are touring and away from home you can understand. I did contemplate my life choices. I did miss home. But on the other side of that, I thrived and I became more confident and I became more independent as a result of the experiences that were afforded to me as part of Lord of the Dance. And I guess one of the defining moments of my time in Lord of the Dance was that it was here, it was in that show, that I met my husband. It's a little bit ironic that I ran away to the circus <laughs> because of a relationship failure, and that's actually where I met my husband. And I guess that lifestyle can only last for so long. You can only tour for so long and dance for so long. So the very difficult decision was made to come home. And cast and crew were not allowed to mix. But Kiwi, who's my husband, he's from New Zealand, his road name kind of stuck, um, we got married. And we moved back here. And I then, whenever I moved home, all of a sudden I realized I was back to square one. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't really want to step back into the classroom, but to fill that void of touring and performing was really tough, and it took a little bit of adjustment. But again, we made a choice. We'd worked together for seven years, so we thought, we'll start a business. And we opened our business in Crossgar, a rural village, in the living room of a small house that we bought on the side of the street. It was a million miles away from our touring life in the States. But that business now affords me the opportunity to connect at the grassroots level with Irish dancing here 
and actually worldwide. My life and my identity is all wrapped up in Irish dancing. And I guess, had it not been for the dots that all connected, I wouldn't be standing here today on this TEDx red dot. I try to approach life now the way that I tell my students to approach their dance practice. Take small steps. Get the basics right. Smile. Be confident. And be happy. You can only do so much. I'm a mum to a very opinionated and spirited 11-year-old girl. Very frustrating at times. But I've learned that I have to juggle things. And sometimes I juggle them really well. Sometimes I juggle them really badly. But I do the best I can. And I'm going to leave you today with the words of Oprah Winfrey. She says, my philosophy for life, my philosophy is that you are responsible, not only responsible for your life, but by being the best you are at this moment, puts you in the best place for the next moment. And I truly believe that there's always a next moment. Just make your choice. Grasp the moment and make it count.